Okay, uh, hello everyone, uh, and welcome along to this uh, very special episode of Susty Talk. Uh, this is Edie's uh, series of candid conversations with the inspirational sustainability and climate leaders who are keeping up the positive momentum in their fields and helping to drive a green recovery um, through this period of, of lockdown, especially here in the UK. Um, now it's Edie's net zero week, um, and to kick it off, I must say it's a real privilege uh, to be joined by today's Susty Talk guest who is none other than Cristiana Figueres. Uh, Cristiana was of course the Executive Secretary to the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change from 2010 to 2016 uh, and during that time in 2015 Cristiana made history uh, as a key architect of the Paris Agreement where famously 195 countries came together um, and came to a consensus around tackling climate change. Um, Christiana, uh, thank you so much for joining us. Firstly, and most importantly, how, how are you keeping it this time and, and where are you connecting to us from? Well, um, I must admit to huge privilege because I am first in the very wonderful country of Costa Rica, my home country, uh, that is currently still holding the world record for lowest mortality rates on COVID. Um, and uh, and I'm personally way down in the south of Costa Rica, just on the tip of the largest national park. Um, and so I have just beautiful surroundings and I see more scarlet macaws and more howler monkeys than humans. So I am quite quite privileged environment. <laughs> wow. But it sounds like it's, a, it's in, a, in a bit of a bubble then in comparison to the rest of the world with regards to coronavirus, COVID-19. Is it just a bit behind, do you feel, or is it, is it, has there been other measures implemented to ensure? Uh, our curve has already bent. Uh, we bent the curve about uh, two or three weeks ago, and uh, it's, one, it's on its uh, very steep decline. We, uh, we are five million people in Costa Rica, and we've only had seven deaths in total. Our ICU units are still uh, underutilized. And uh, we have just really, the government has been, um, with draconian measures, uh, has really capped the incidence very low. And with a very highly educated population that we have in Costa Rica, we've all been uh, pretty obedient. Mm -hmm. So it's been, it's, it's been a tough experience, certainly for those in the informal sector who have lost their livelihoods and and that's the, uh, the the major issue now is how to bring those people back into the workforce as quickly as possible. But I would say the health crisis, we have survived very well. And uh, we're now heading into uh, alleviating the economic crisis uh, with recovery measures. Mm. Okay. Has, of course, been an incredibly challenging time for, for everyone around the world. And uh, many aspects of uh, economies and businesses have had to, had to slow down or completely shut down in order to tackle this crisis. So, Christiana, I wanted to get your thoughts on, on where this climate crisis actually, where the climate crisis actually sort of fits into this right now. Um, what connections, if any, can be drawn between the, uh, the existential threat of climate change and um, the existential threat of, uh, and ha tackling this pandemic? Um. Yeah, it's very interesting, right? Because on the one hand, they are very, very different crises. Uh, the um, pandemic crisis is an acute crisis that happened very quickly, moved very, very quickly, and has hit very deeply. Um, uh, and the uh, climate crisis is not acute, it's chronic. We've known about it for a long time and, uh, and, and will also hit very deeply. The difference, of course, is I think uh, the tempo of the advance that we see the movement through the health crisis in matters of days and weeks and months. And we see the movement through the climate crisis actually much more in months and years and decades. Um, and so therefore it is understandable that we humans in our infinite lack of capacity to uh, think and act long-term, we have actually um, dealt better with the immediate threat than we do with a threat that is perceived to be somewhere down the line. Mm. That, is, um, that, that is why I think it's very important to understand that we have huge lessons to learn from this immediate crisis, from this acute and, cro and chronic crisis, with huge lessons to learn that should um, prepare us to deal better with the climate crisis. Because um, both of them are high probability, high impact risks 
And for both of them, what we have already learned is that delay is very costly. It is definitely better to prevent than to cure. We learned that from COVID-19, and it is definitely true about climate change. It's mm -hmm. definitely true that it's better to act early rather than later, and that the costs only escalate, escalate exponentially with delay. The mm -hmm. current costs of, uh, of climate, uh, un unless we do the right thing, are actually could all go up to $600 trillion. And so while the 15 trillion that have already been dedicated to economic recovery of COVID and could go up to 20 trillion, while that is historic, and we have never seen such injection of capital into the economy, the fact is, um, that it is an antecedent, or let's call it um, a, um, a a trial run for what we would have to do if we don't deal with climate change. Nobody asked for these two crises to collide onto each other. We definitely didn't, but they have. And so now I think the responsibility is to make the solutions converge. That is where we really need to pay our attention. And as we inject fresh money into the system, as uh, the economy begins to move its wheels again, as jobs begin to open up and be created, it is absolutely important that both governments, but also businesses, look at carbon constraint, or rather, let's think of it positively, the increasing efficiency of carbon as being one of the design principles of the recovery processes. This, this um, crisis has been so broad and so deep that there's no way we're going to get out of it without definite focus on innovation and new ways of doing everything, whether you're a government or whether you're a corporate. And that innovation has to have carbon efficiency as one of its core principles and guidelines. And if we do that, then we will be able to recover from this crisis and prevent the worst of the climate crisis. Okay. Um, and I also mentioned, I mentioned at the start of this conversation that this is happening during ED's Net Zero Week, uh, which is all about kind of keeping up momentum and, and taking new actions to drive um, us towards a net zero carbon economy. Um, I guess if we if we put COVID-19 aside for a moment, what, what have you made of the UK's net zero target and, and what areas of policy do you think may require the most focus or development now to actually make net zero happen in a country like this? Well, um, actually, it's very difficult to put COVID to the side because mm -hmm. uh, it is definitely the most transformational uh, that has ever occurred in living history. And, um, or in fact, some people argue in the past 500 years. And so I don't really want to put things to the side because they actually, the situation that we're in actually opens many possibilities for being more responsible on climate and being more responsible on emissions. Um, so let me give you, you know, uh, a couple of examples. Air travel. Air travel is not going to return to where we were because most of us have become pretty fluent in these kinds of technologies. And it'll be very difficult to convince people that it's worth their time to travel three times around the planet to go to a meeting that lasts one or two or four hours. It's just not gonna happen again. So business travel will definitely be changed. Even land transportation, commuting on a daily basis will also be changed because I'm willing to bet that corporations have learned that most of their employees can be just as efficient and just as effective and just as productive working from home. That's not true of everyone because some people have very difficult work conditions, but it is true of most people. And so corporates will want to actually save office space and not have to uh, use 100% of the space or build buildings for 100% of their employees, but rather to cut down to 40 or 50 or 60 percent of their employees because the others will be rotating around and working from home. Urban design is going to be different because we will be having with less commuting, we will be having 
less use for uh, roads and bridges and cars that will be going in and out, especially everything that is that is um, private transportation. And so maybe urban designers have a little bit more flexibility now to design in more green spaces or certainly more spaces for biking and pedestrians um, than we did before. Um, I think the other thing that is going to be changing a lot is um, residential um, re residential habits because there are so many people who in this crisis have actually chosen to leave the big cities, to leave London and leave the small flats and leave the big cities in the UK and go and, you know, either live in their second homes if they're fortunate enough to have that or with family members that live outside um, or even rent something outside. Um, and the, the virtues and the benefits of living with more green space and with more space in general, um, I think has become all of a sudden a reality that we hadn't realized before. So, you know, there's so many aspects that are actually very, very deeply transformed by the reality that we're living now. Of course, it's difficult to know which ones of these are going to be more or less sticky, but I don't think that we can pretend that the reality that we're living right now will just disappear and we will go back to where we were in November or December of last year. Um, I just don't think that that's realistic and I think it behooves all of us to understand that we're getting ready for a different reality and that that reality has to be much more carbon efficient. Mm. Okay, um, and I'm gonna just with my closing question, uh, I'm going to uh, actually use the book, use your book, uh, which I've just finished reading, and I must recommend to uh, anyone that's remotely interested in in the climate change um, debate. Um, and uh, particularly, the thing that sort of stood out for me was the the final section, the kind of what you can do now section, um, because it gives you tangible, kind of clear advice about what we can all do to to overcome the climate crisis. So, Christiana, final question: If you were to have to rewrite that section now for for Edie's audiences of, of, of audience of, of businesses, um, especially in light of the pandemic we're battling at the moment, what would be the key points you would make within it? What can this audience do now to help um, overcome the cri climate crisis? Well, I, I think one thing that we didn't mention, mention clearly enough is the need to establish your baseline, to use a you know pretty uh, everywhere available carbon calculator to figure out what your personal, what your family, what your corporate carbon footprint is right now. And then figure out where the bigger chunks are and through the innovation of both technology and work and living practices that we're all going to have to do, um, really commit to figuring out how do you bring that, that carbon footprint down to one half of what it is today, um, certainly before 2030. That is entirely doable. In fact, it is doable before 2030, um, but it must be done at the very latest by 2030. I think the opportunity for that is much, much broader now than it was just a couple of months ago. Um, and, uh, and, and the responsibility for doing so is also much more evident because if we humans are having a very hard time surviving this crisis, getting through it and getting to thriving after the crisis, it is even more, um, it is even more challenging if we are ever to hit the threshold of the climate crisis as scientists have defined it and described it. So we do not want to put ourselves in the situation of jumping out of the frying pan and then falling into the raging fire of climate, uh, of, a, of a runaway climate change. This is an, an enormous responsibility to change the way we act in the world, the technologies that we use, the way we work. Um, and it is all entirely possible. So bottom line, good news. That's a good bottom line to end on. Um, thank you so much. I'll bring this chat to a close now. Um, Christiana, I really appreciate your time. I hope you stay safe and well there in, in Costa Rica. Thank you. And then we can have you along to an ED event uh, very soon. Thanks to everyone for tuning in. Um, stay safe, uh, stay positive, and keep up the Susty Talk. Thanks and goodbye. Thanks. Bye.